John chapter 17. I'm going to read one verse of your in your hearing from this chapter, but of course, we'll go back and look at it. So we encourage you to keep your Bibles open there, devices, whatever you're using. John chapter 17. Jesus is speaking, and he said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus didn't just do the work of God. He also did the will of God. Now the goal is for us to do the work and the will and to be one and the same. But are you aware that people can do the work of God instead of the will of God? Jesus' work was the will of the Father. He said in John 15, 10, as I have kept my Father's commandments, he said, I kept them. You need to keep them. As I abode in his love, you need to abide in his love. But the point of the scripture is that he did the work and the bidding and the commandment of his father. Jesus said to Philip in John 14, verse 11 and 12, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. But if you don't believe that, Believe me for the sake of the works themselves. In other words, I'm telling you that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But my works back up my claim that I am the Almighty God. So I'm telling you, he did the works of God, the works of his Father, but he also did the will of his father. In Acts 13, 36, David said after he served, it spoke of David and said after David served his own generation, after he did the works of God, but it was by the will of God is when he fell asleep. So bringing your attention back to verse number four of John 17, Jesus said, I finished the work. And by the help of the Lord, I just want to preach for just a little bit here about this subject. Purpose made simple. Purpose made simple. How many believe the Lord can give someone direction that they did not have when they came into this building? How many believe the Lord can give somebody direction that's watching right now that, that you are aimless? How many believe the Lord can give us direction as a church? I'm telling you, I want to just simplify it. Let's get the Jesus purpose. Father, without you, I can do nothing. With you, all things are possible. Anoint my mind. Anoint the ears of your hearers. Let your spirit accomplish what it's set out to do. In the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. God bless you, you may be seated. Purpose made simple. Inhale and exhale. Breathe. I want us to embrace simplicity here today. I'd like for us to enjoy the freedom from complexity and the simplicity that I felt in my spirit to, by his help, create in this atmosphere. The big idea today, the objective, is to make simple this idea of purpose. Anybody been ever been guilty of overthinking something? (laughs) I guess all of us at some point or another. And we use the word purpose, a synonym would be a reason. In other words, purpose is the reason for which something is done or something is created or something exists. What's the purpose of what was done, what was created, what exists? 
And I want you to know as I speak today, purpose can be applied to you individually, whether you're a first time guest or you've been a member here for a long time. Purpose can also be applied to this local church, the community that we are together in the kingdom of God. It's hard to believe that today is August 1st and we're just almost a month away from what was at noon on July 2nd, the beginning of the second half of 2021. Officially, we have 152 days left in 2021. Now, there's nothing sacred about a calendar year, but it certainly can be a point of reference, a mile marker, a point of motivation. We talked to you a couple weeks ago. If God still allows us to be here, maybe you'll think about those cicadas in 17 years. <laughs> but in this now over half a year, as a church, we've done series on your significance and finding my fit and the book of Esther and who is my neighbor and miracles. We've talked about hope is alive because of the church. And hope is alive because Jesus died, but it's alive because Jesus is alive. We've given you disciple makers training. We've talked about how to share your faith. And what I'm trying to say is the purpose, the purpose, the reason for it all. As I opened up this calendar year, 2021, we talked about everything that happened. You can look right now at everything that's happened in 2021. And let me tell you, in the last three months in my life, in my family's life, there's been a whole lot happening. That's why I'm checking out of here for a few minutes. But even back to 2020, but not just calendar years, would you not agree? Your entire life to this date, things have happened. And we've got to find the purpose in it all. We, we've got to know why we do what we do. We've got to make purpose simple in our individual journeys. John Gardner, who at the time of my reading was chairman of Common Cause, he tells a story of an elderly gentleman that would ask the same question to just about every new acquaintance that he came in contact with. And here was his question. He would say, what have you done that you believe in and you're proud of? He didn't, he didn't ask the conventional, what do you do for a living? He said, what have you done that you believe in and that you're proud of? And they said it was really kind of an unsettling question for those that got their value or their self-esteem from their wealth or their family name or their exalted job title. They didn't know how to answer that question. But this man was delighted when he heard from a woman, when, when he asked her, what do you believe in? What have you done? What have you done that you believe in and that you're proud of? And she said, I'm doing a good job raising my three children. He was delighted when a cabinet maker said, I believe in good workmanship and I practice it. Or by a person that simply said, I started a bookstore and it's the best bookstore for miles around. This man said, I really don't care how they answer. I just want to put this thought in their mind. Hear me, that they should live their lives in such a way that they have a good answer. Not a good answer for me, but for themselves. And so, if you will today, let me unpinch that. Let's zoom out just a moment and ask a greater question to you today. What do you believe in that contributes to the eternal purpose of God? What do you believe in? And that belief expresses and contributes to the eternal purpose purpose of God. And whatever it is, I'm saying with this gentleman, live in such a way that you can have a good answer. I'm talking about being fulfilled by doing his will and following his purpose and his design for you. But hear me, it's not just you. It's how you fit into the eternal plan of God. 
It's often been said, if you want to know, are you listening? If you want to know why you're placed on this planet, you got to begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. And the reason I say that is because many times the search for purpose has typically begun at the wrong starting point. We start with ourselves. And we ask questions that are really kind of self-centered. What do I want to be? What should I do with my life? What are my goals or my ambitions or my dreams for the future? But you hear me, focusing on yourself will never reveal life's purpose for you. Because it's the wrong premise. It's not about you. That's why people got more money than you could ever dream of. But they're not fulfilling a purpose because it's about them. But I'm telling you, the purpose for your life is greater than your own personal fulfillment. It's even greater than your own peace of mind. And I'd like to have it, but I'd rather have purpose over some just appeasement of my mind. It's greater than your happiness. Purpose must begin with a revelation from God Almighty. If you want to know your purpose, begin with God. Ask God. Seek Him. Only God can answer your quest to find and discover your origin, your meaning, your purpose, your significance, your destiny. God created us. He created you. How many believe God created you? I'm going to pass her for a minute. I'm going to get back to my topic. So if you believe God created you, why do you say that you're such junk and not worth anything? I'm just saying, I mean, if I created some sculptor, beautiful sculptor, first of all, that's a miracle. <laughs> but if I created that and you go, oh, that's sick. No, no, that's an expression of me. I'm going back to the topic. How many believe God created you? You're afraid to raise your hand again, aren't you? So man, last time I did that, I got spanked. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to help you. Let, let me say something here. When God created you, he, he created an owner's manual. You know, when you buy something just yesterday, when we were closing out the house, selling our house, and we got a big old thick book of all the, you'd be proud of me, Reverend. Proud of my wife, probably. I'm sure it wasn't as orderly as yours. We stuff it, but all the documents. In fact, our realtor said that shows owner's care. But I was looking through all that, and there's all kinds of manuals to tell you how to run everything. Doesn't mean anything to me. That's not going to set me up for my illustration, is it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> because of my negligence to read it and receive it. I'll preach that. Hang on just a minute. But we understand the Word of God is our owner's manual. If something's not working in your life, when's the last time you went back to the manual? That's why we believe in personal Bible studies. We've had folks call us in church and say, we need help with our marriage. And I tell them, let's start them in a Bible study. What? Not Bible study, I need marriage. He created you. It's the owner's manual. I'm not suggesting we don't need targeted help. Of course we do. But what I'm trying to tell you is it's the owner's manual that we go back to. And through that word, God has revealed his simple purpose for you and me and this church. Purpose made simple. Now, I told them in media, save everything because I may not get to it all and I'll preach it in September if God lets me. But hear me, hear me today. The key to not being weighed down, the key to not being bogged down with some heavy mystic seeking of God's purpose. What is your purpose, Lord? What is your purpose? Let me, let me, let me help you with some purpose that could just be made real simple. And I'm sure there's other things, but here's what I want you to look at. Check it out. Number one, do what you know to do. 
Everybody say obedience. There's a lot of great writings that the Apostle Paul gave in reference to the church in Philippi. You know that one where he says, whatsoever is lovely, pure, there be any virtue or praise, think on those things. You know that one? Okay. You know what the next verse says? Philippians 4, 9. Sometimes we don't quote that quite as much. It says, the things which you have learned, received, and heard, and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Oh, whatever you've learned, received, heard, seen, do. So, purpose made simple is just do what you know to do. I know you're waiting for the next point. Do what you know to do. You're waiting on God and God's waiting on you. If you'll walk in obedience, purpose will just unfold in your life. Number two, walk through the doors, God opens. Everybody shout faith. An open door is of no use unless you walk through it. Now that was deep, wasn't it? So deep it might transform you that there's many times God has already opened the door. He's waiting on you to have enough faith and action to step through it. So if you want purpose, just do what you know to do. And when God opens the door through your obedience, have faith and walk through it. This is too simple, isn't it? Number three, stay out of the doors he closes. That's called submission. Some of y'all don't have any problem walking through the doors he opens. You just have problems staying out of the doors he's closing. Now hear me, I'm going to be practical. I think it's okay to test the doorknob. In other words, what I mean by that, I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, should I, should I seek this job or should I do something? I don't want my action to say that I don't trust him. I'll say, you know what? Always put it in the Father's hands. But if you try different options, that's like to me trying the proverbial door to see if it's unlocked. But let me tell you something. Are you listening to me? When you turn it and it doesn't budge, don't force it open. We got too many spiritual breaking and entering criminals. Because if the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, so are the stops. And you're fussing that God didn't open a door that you wanted when he says, I love you enough to keep it locked. Now submit, get your hands off it, and wait for the next move. How's everybody doing out there? Another thing you got to do, purpose made simple, is acknowledge him. Let's see what it says. Can't wait to find out. Acknowledge him. And then he will direct you. It's called recognition of God. Uh, Have you ever been ignored? Or maybe you ever talk to somebody and they're not looking at you when, when you're talking to them. You know, just look at me. Make eye contact. Or at least act like I'm here. What is that? That's recognition. That's acknowledgement. It's just a natural thing to want to be acknowledged. So here's what I'm wondering. Do you suppose God's ever been there and done that? You're making all your plans, trying all your doors, doing all your thing. And and he's saying, you know what? Hello. Here I am. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Acknowledge. Make eye contact. Admit to something is true. Recognize the authority. That's what acknowledgement is. Recognize the answer. Because when you, are you listening? When you acknowledge the Lord, the, there's some biblical principles that are set in motion. 
If you want guidance and purpose, you've got to acknowledge, and as Solomon said, acknowledge God in all your ways, and then he will direct your paths. You're wanting direction and purpose, and you don't even act like he's there. Look at me. Acknowledge me. Let me show up. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to teach you. You can call it what you want. But I'm saying, God, I said today, Jesus, how much money do you want for your house that we're selling? It's not my house. It's not my money. I'm just a steward of it. And when you start acting like he's the Lord of your life, then maybe he'll give you direction. Purpose. But we're over there. Hey, can you get over and help me? Let's try again. That looks like if I didn't get the answer I wanted, let me find out. Let me get somebody else here to tell me what I want to hear. Everybody still want purpose? You got to acknowledge. And by the way, it says acknowledge him in on Sunday mornings. The great I am, the great I am. Then you walk out of here, you make your own life and decisions. I'm telling you, your relationship with Jesus is so minuscule in this Sunday worship gathering and even your community groups compared to what it's like to live with him all the time and have a relationship with him. What areas have you not acknowledged him? What's his advice? It's got to be in all of your ways. You've got to connect to the values and the priorities. Hey, you know what the scripture says? David told his son Solomon, he said, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. And if you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll reject you forever. It's not hard. Just act like he's there and he'll direct you. Here's another one. Love God and do as you please. Everybody say love. love. Now that's not an apostolic quote, but it works. St. Augustine said, love God and do as you please. Are you understanding that? If you don't, I'll take you to Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? They had over 600 commandments. And he, they said, we want to know which one is the greatest. And Jesus looked at him and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. That's the first and great commandment. And by the way, I'll give you the second one. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments hang all of their present day Bible. All of the law and prophets hang on those. I agree with Augustine. If you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, go ahead and do whatever you please because you're connected to the vine and you're doing the Father's will. It's so simple. If you love Jesus with all your heart, then you can do as you please because his purpose is your purpose. Are you chewing on that? Thank you, son. <laughs> Let me take you to this text here for a moment. John 17, I know we talk about Matthew 6 being the Lord's prayer, our Father which art in heaven, that's really the disciples' prayer, what we're supposed to use as a model or the principles we can extract from prayer. I, I offer that John 17 is the Lord's prayer, the real Lord's prayer. 
And you have to understand by context here that John 17 caps off a very intimate discourse with Jesus' disciples because he's about ready to enter into his final suffering and crucifixion and resurrection. I'm not trying to uh, be dramatic or try to cause any angst to you, but hear me. It's as if you knew someone was about to leave and every word that you were hearing from them, that's the setting of what Jesus gave to him. And as Jesus prays to the Father in John 17, it is Christ, the Messiah, as the God-man that naturally prays to his Father. There's only one God. But John, in his gospel, uses incarnational language. God in the flesh. The Father that has no beginning or ending. The flesh of God, the Son that began, was begotten in Bethlehem. And look what he says in verse 1. Jesus is praying and he spoke these words as he lifted his eyes to heaven. He said, Father... The hour has come. He knew what was ahead of him. He said, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As God who came in the flesh, Jesus' incarnation, his dissension, it was a condescension, condescension from glory, all of heaven's glory, to human suffering, to the resurrection. I'm so glad to know that John 1.1 1, 1 taught us all about who Jesus is and the incarnation. When he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in John 1.14, it says that Word became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When Jesus, as that God-man, walked among us, it was God in flesh. That's why Paul taught us in Colossians 2.9, in him, in Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is who Jesus is. And as he walked physically on this earth, Paul told Timothy later on in 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The Godhead is not a mystery. What we'll never figure out is how our almighty God could come in flesh and dwell among us. Look what it says. Here's the mystery. How God could be manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. I'll never figure that out, but I say thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth. So he said the hour has come, John 17, 1. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. Look at what he said in verse 2. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And you want to know what eternal life is? Read on. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, that God who became flesh, whom you sent. Jesus had already said in John 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That's who Jesus is. And he said in verse 14, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work in which you have given me to do. Look at that verse and I ask you a question. Jesus said he glorified the Father. How did he do that? How did he glorify him? Because he is my example. That's how I'm going to glorify. I'll tell you how Jesus did it. By obeying his heavenly assignment and fulfilling his purpose. And if you want to know how you can glorify God, 
It's by obeying your heavenly, eternal assignment and fulfilling the purpose that you have called, been called to do. I love worshiping God. I love coming together and singing. I love singing in our community groups. But hear me today. If all you think glorifying God is, is just raising your hand and feeling Jesus, let me tell you, that's not half of what glorifying God's all about. Glorifying God is what has he called you to do? And are you fulfilling the purpose that he has called you to? Jesus said, I've glorified you because I finished the work which you've given me to do. And when God comes for his people and he looks at us, I want him to say, well, well, well worship, well singing, well done, well done, because you've done what I've asked you to do. That's how you glorify God. Anybody got ID on you? Identification? I don't need to see it. You're afraid to raise your hand. Maybe you don't have it. Driver's license, official ID. I'm gonna give you the spiritual ID card of every person that's being transformed into the image of God. Here's what we want to say. Five simple things. I'm a worshiper. I'm a holy one. I'm a connector. I'm a minister. And I'm a harvester. What am I talking about? I'm talking about how you can bring glory to God is you bring glory to God by worshiping him. And as it's stated, it's not just in a worship gathering, but I'll start there. You know what? I, I, I'm, I have a role as a spiritual leader and I have a role as a saint to stay out of everybody's business, okay? But let me tell you something, as a pastor, I get concerned sometimes when some of you have been born again for many years and you look like a wall when you come into God's presence. You don't have to act like me. In fact, I don't recommend it. But I'm talking about, is there any engagement on our face? Is there anything stirring in our heart? Because what I'm going to tell you is, if we have trouble worshiping God here, how can we worship him in our stewardship of our time and our talent and our treasure? And we're in the culture that's not against God, that's not for God. Let me tell you, we need to start with lifted hands, open spirits, unclenched fists, and let there be a free flow of worship. But as important as that is, it's got to go into our decisions and our lifestyles and say everything I have is the Lord's and he just lets me manage it. It's not your job. It's not your car. It's not anything but God's. Somebody say, I'm a worshiper. I'm a holy one. You know what that means? I bring glory to God when I become like Jesus Christ. When I'm a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When I, our goal at this church is to develop disciples who will declare the gospel. We do it through systematic discipleship like discovery, but we must do it through relational discipleship. When you come alongside one another, whatever it may be, fishing or shopping or hiking, we do things together. Cookouts are spiritual, but I'm telling you, there's nothing that's better in my view than a personal Bible study and a community group where there's some systems in it, but there's organic life and relational life. We've got to be a disciple maker. I'm a holy one. You know how else I bring glory to God? By loving other believers. 
Come on, look up here. Some of you'd rather love Jesus than love me. I was thinking this. Brother Drew, I, I didn't know this past Friday, those of you here at the NAYC, thought it was awesome about how we have to love everybody. And I got to thinking, I wonder if it's easier to love somebody that's of a different culture, and I know it has its challenges, but I wonder sometimes if it's different or easier for the youth or anybody to love a different culture that they really don't know, but have to love the guy or gal they're going back home with in the van. It's easy to love theory. My Bible says we're members of one another. Individualism is an American word, not a Bible word. I'll tell you an Olympic story, not at this particular Olympics, but in the past. There was an Olympian from Australia. An interviewer asked the question, do you feel the weight of all of Australia on your shoulders? That's a great question, you know, to kind of help him win the race. Uh, do you feel the weight of all of Australia on your shoulders? He said, no, I really don't. He said, I feel the country behind me creating a wave to push me to the finish. Look around you. <laughs> These are people here that wants to help one another. Let's go to heaven together. We're a community. And you'll hear more about that. But that means we don't pick or choose whether we're going to fellowship in groups or not. Somebody shout, I'm a minister. We bring glory to God by serving others with our gifts. That's why we talked about finding your fit and your servant profile. What's your passion? Where you serve? Your spiritual gifts, what you do, and your personal style, how you express it. We've got to be involved. And it's not. We, we need help in this local assembly, but it's not that. It's just, it's serving the community. It's serving the world. And then finally, we bring glory to God by telling others about him. I'm a harvester. I take spiritual risk. Jesus' mission is mine. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. You guys can come, give them some hope here. In this church, what I've just shown you on the screen, in my view, is capsulized in our purpose here at this church, and actually it's also our process. Experience God, grow in your faith, serve others, and go reach the world. That's how you find purpose is when you connect to God. And if you're here today and you've never experienced God in the born again experience, I'm telling you today, you can, you can put your faith in Jesus Christ. You can express your faith in Jesus and believe that that good news of the gospel, that he died for you, he was buried for you, he rose again for you, and you know what, I can identify on all points, because when I repent of my sins, and when I'm baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, forgiveness, removal of those sins, and when I come up out of the water resurrected, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking a language I never learned, I identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. That's experiencing God. Is anybody else in the room besides me found out there's a whole lot more to experience in God than just that initial spiritual birth? <laughs> I got to seek him. I got to know him. Oh, why don't you lift that other hand right now and let's talk to him. Hallelujah. 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 And then we've got to grow in our faith. Growing comes from that owner's manual, the Bible, but it also comes from being with people. You know, I'm more spiritual when I'm by myself. Because you're not testing my spirituality. But I need you. And you need me. We got to grow. We got to serve. Are you listening to me? I don't read in my Bible where you get to get born again 
but serve as an option like electric windows in a car. And neither do I read my Bible that I get to opt out on going and reaching the other world and my world and making disciples of all nations. We do it through our different giftings. We don't do it alone, but all of us are called to do that. You were not saved to sit on a purple chair. Now, let me wrap it up by asking you this question. How do we find purpose? You may ask me, how do you find fulfillment? I see two options. And here's what people do. When you don't know the point of life, I see two options. Number one, you make up your own. People do it all the time. Try to find some meaning through a hobby, a sport, a craft, a career. Are all those things wrong? No. But it's what feeds you, what's at the center. And there's people that are trying to find fulfillment. Solomon said, if you don't have, you don't know your purpose in life, your life's gonna be meaningless, it's gonna be tiresome, it's gonna be unfulfilling, it's gonna be uncontrollable. And what I'm saying is, how we find purpose is that when we don't know it, we default by making up our own. Those activities are fun, but they can leave you feeling like something's missing and there's something more to life. If you're listening to me today and you've been searching and you've been hungry, whether you're spirit filled or not, if you're searching for something, don't make it up on your own. Go through door number two. And this is the second option. Discover God's purpose. He's the creator of all things, and so he alone is the source of finding purpose, a reason why you exist, a reason. If you want to know your purpose in life, you must begin with God, not yourself. And you know what else? You can't find your purpose in what other people think. No matter how much of an expert they are, I'm not trying to be unkind. I hear a lot of people, they talk to me, and sometimes you got to listen how much they talk about what other people think they ought to be doing. And people that want to offer opinions and their life's out of control, but they've got the answer for you. What I'm trying to tell you is you can't find your purpose in what people think, knowing God's purpose for you, what it's His purpose. I'm not even trying to find my purpose. I'm trying to say, what's your purpose and how do I connect to it? How do I express it? Because you hear me, without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, Life has no significance or hope. So I haven't come to depress you. I've come to give you hope. Because there's a God in this house that can give us purpose. As a church, he's given us direction and purpose. And, and there's gonna be some things in September as we continue and I want you to hear this message I've been preaching so that you understand we're not interested in programs or activities. We're interested in everything moving us towards the purpose of God. Would you pray wherever you are right now? If you're watching in the living room, if you're sitting here looking at me, come on, let's pray right now. Whether you're a guest or a member, whether you're an occasional attender or you're a charter member, I want us to pray right now and say, Jesus, help us, help us God to do what really matters. To know, Lord, that more than anything else, I don't want to fulfill my dreams or, or other people's expectations, but I need you today. I need you today. That's it, come on, seek the Lord. Your future's not ahead of you, it's within you. I said your future's not ahead of you, it's within you because God's purpose is there. You are his creation. You have been called by him. And if you're here today, you can be born again of the water and spirit. Hallelujah. You can connect to what God has for you. I believe somebody here can have a revelation in this meeting of what God wants you to do.